Recap Ago for May 1st, 2023. Keep up to date with the important happenings in the Go community in just 15 minutes per week. I'm your co-host, Shai Nechmad. And I'm your other co-host, Jonathan Hall. Happy May Day. Hey, and yeah. And Workers Day. I wish you would was... record this, uh, you know, in three days, and then we could have been like May the 4th and all that. Oh, uh, geek. Yeah. Goodness. May the 4th be with us all. All right. So, topping off the week... Uh, we just dropped this morning, I think, or maybe earlier over the weekend, uh, an announcement that we have another uh, release of Go 120 coming out and Go 119. Uh, three, I believe, security releases or, or security fixes are included in this release, will be included in this release tomorrow. So get your finger on the deploy button so you can update to the latest version of Go tomorrow morning or afternoon or whatever time it happens to be in your time zone when that happens. And if you care about what the security fixes are, you can't know them now. They're private. That's right. You'll have it's to wait secret. until the, after the release. Unless you can get ChatGPT to somehow leak that information to you, which I've heard about people doing with CVEs. So, What do you mean? Yeah, some people, so like if you start uh, asking ChatGPT, so suppose you discover the CVE and you're asking ChatGPT to reword it for you or whatever, sometimes it can keep that secret information and regurgitate it to other people if they ask the right questions. Ah, nice. So don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your private data private. Don't give it to ChatGPT. It's untrustworthy. Um, but you can email it to us. At new- We're very trustworthy. Yes. Just send course. us emails at news at kappago.dev and we'll we'll keep your secrets private. Shh. We won't tell anybody until it serves our purpose. All right. Usually this is the part of the show where we talk about proposals, but we don't have the minutes from this week. And ChatGPT didn't leak us any information yet. Yeah, um, sad. So no proposal news this week. Catch up next week. We'll probably have a ton to talk about. Uh, but we do want to update you all about uh, Conf 42. So we mentioned this conference a few times. It's, it was an online session. Uh, and the talks are now available uh, online on YouTube. We'll post the link in the show notes. It, it's very varied, right, Jonathan? It's not like one topic covered in the conference. Yeah. So it was focused around Go, but... You could probably find something that interests you there. Definitely. I mean, there's stuff that's specifically tailored for, for beginners, and there's more advanced stuff like memory heap optimization and you know, sort of everything in between, how to use Go and Redis together and transaction management and the repository pattern. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Yeah, and I like the Go Yak specifically, using Go for automation. Looking back, I had a script folder in the monorepo of my previous company, uh, and we were using Bash and SH. That was like our core automation thing. Uh, looking back, if I could have started in Go, I would have started in Go. Could have been such a good decision. But alas, the past is the past. Uh, but you can uh, uh, not uh, have do that that mistake. Go watch the conference talks. Learn about new stuff. And they have a cool intro theme, like like this sort of deep note, almost like the. I don't know if everybody knows just the THX sound effect that they would play at the beginning of movies. Kind of reminds me of that. So that, that's cool. <laughs> I don't know if it carries over the mic, but uh, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. There are a few sound bites, you know, that really it, it trigger like a subconscious response. One thing is the TED thing where it goes like, I don't know if this will carry over the mic, but where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and then the tingles. I used to watch TED Talks every night before I went to sleep when I was in the army. So now I'm just the moment I hear that sound, I'm like, uh, time to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the reverse alarm clock effect where you start hating your songs. Uh, so, yeah, that's about Con 42. If you need something to listen to or watch. After you finish your Cup of Go backlog, of course, uh, then right. you can go watch uh, these talks. Next up, we have a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And not because it's really that important, but because it involves me. <laughs> so here's the story. Back in 2021, in May, so, wow, it's almost exactly two years ago, May 13, I made a proposal to the Go project. And it was accepted. It's a really minor, minor proposal. So I'm not really super excited about that. All it is, is adding uh, two functions to the regular expression library to make regular expression objects marshallable and unmarshable. So you can basically treat them as JSON if you want to. 
And after a little bit of discussion, uh, it was accepted. And then just about two weeks ago, I finally decided to actually make the change because nobody else did. And my change was accepted. So I am going to, I'm an official Go contributor now. Which and makes I will... this show so much more reputable. Yeah. I'm your co-host, Shai Nechmad, and I'm your other co-host and official Go contributor, Jonathan Hall. Now, I don't want to toot my own horn too much. I mean, th- these are super, super simple changes. Basically, it just wraps existing functions with the text marshal and uh, text unmarshal names. Uh, it's like four lines of code. It's not really a big deal. It's but a the reason- huge deal. Is it Everybody okay. go to the community pedestal. We have the Jonathan pedestal in the middle of the town square. Oh, please uh, lay out your offerings. <laughs> oh, congratulations, Matt. That's awesome. Uh, I, think it's a, I think it is a big milestone, um, I don't know, personally. Okay. I, 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 uh, the, the feeling of actually contributing to the language, not just the community and not just no. the meetups and not just the podcast and not just the work, uh, but actually contributing to the language itself. I think it's really cool. Well, thanks, Sean. I'm kind of jealous. No, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Well, if you if you are jealous also, dear listener, um, I decided to turn this into a video explaining the process and hopefully making it a little bit less intimidating so that you might be encouraged to do something similar. So uh, I'll have a link to that in the show notes if you're interested in watching me document the process uh, kind of real time. I kind of picked it up halfway through the process and showed what I did. And it's really not as scary as it might sound. So if you have a great idea to add to the standard library or a Go feature or whatever, um, check out that video and see if maybe you could join me on that pedestal. Very cool. Um, so this week we found a lot of little gems around the community. Some posts that we've been wanting to talk about for a while and some stuff on Reddit. So we'll try to briefly touch each one, not dive too deep into the posts themselves. And if they interest you more, check out the show notes. We'll post the link to every, uh, every one of these uh, community posts. Uh, and the first one we wanted to talk about actually touches uh, WebSockets, which we covered before in one of our first episodes, I think, where we talked about Gorilla being archived. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, just to sort of give a background. What's Gorilla and specifically why is it useful for WebSockets? Well, Gorilla is a, a web toolkit. Uh, it contains a whole bunch of little bits, context management and so on. But the WebSockets library, uh, in particular, or I shouldn't say library, but the component of of the web uh, of the, the toolkit that does WebSockets, I, I think for a very long time was the go to WebSockets library for Go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sure standard, there been, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there've been competitors all along, but that was by far the most popular one. I've used it on at least two projects. Uh, so when it was archived, of course, the the immediate question a lot of people had was, well, what are we going to use for WebSockets now? And we found a blog post talking about WebSockets it, uh, with a very small full pr- footprint in Go uh, by Druva.com. We're going to put the uh, link in the show notes, so don't worry about it. Um, but it covers what WebSockets are, um, which I think, by the way, most web developers, whether you're doing backend, frontend, or full stack, um, approach way too late. WebSockets mm-hmm. are should be the go-to for so many interactions but we're just so used to doing client server that it's i don't know i guess it is the default default option it's the first thing you reach towards but websockets are incredibly useful uh and usually they can make your your app or your site or whatever use them well feel really good that's one thing Mm -hmm. i found It, it removes a lot of limitations of like loaders and and i don't know client server ish thinking yeah and they mention a bunch of libraries uh, whether it's uh, net slash websocket, um, whether it's Gorilla websocket, which is obviously not relevant anymore, and they're they're saying here that they recommend uh, Gobwes slash WS, uh, a lightweight lightweight websocket library, which we discussed here in the past. Um, so this post really goes through everything. Uh, how to develop it and solutions and problems and communications. Has a ton of graphs. And I think that it should be the go-to post if you want to start doing WebSockets now using Go. It's a really, really good introduction. If you're commissioned to do a WebSocket thing at your company, then you need to write the design document. Put this as one of the references. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a good option now. The API is really friendly, and it's very lightweight. It's very Go-ish in that sense. It's not hard to get into, I think. Next up, we have a good question 
a little bit broad, but it's still a good question uh, on Reddit. Which book should I read as an experienced Go developer? And I, I got the same question asked on my YouTube channel th- yesterday also. These, so I don't know if it's the same person. Probably not. Um, it's probably a very common question. Because uh, I, I did a, a review, uh, a series of book reviews uh, earlier this year about what book you should read if you're just getting started with Go. Uh, so but what if you already know Go? What books should you read? And there's some great to- uh, great discussions in here, great uh, suggestions and, and discussion about them. Uh, one of the top voted answers is 100 Go Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. And my copy of that book just arrived a few days ago. I intend to make a review of that. Wait, I wait, let, let's uh, get, a, get a screenshot of that, at least for the Slack uh, uh, group. It's a good, a good chance to shout out the Slack group if you want to see John holding up a copy of a book. That's where <laughs> the only place you can find it. Exclusive to Slack. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then others, uh, Concurrency and Go, that's one that I've heard recommended heavily. I haven't read it myself. Uh, I don't know. Have you read any books about Go that you could recommend? So my feeling is that I try to read a few language-specific or text-specific uh, books, but it's always better, at least for me, to go with a generalist uh, book uh, that's written well and is practical, but it's not specific to a technology, and then mm-hmm. try to apply it. And the specific things for a language or a, or a thing, I prefer to go to the documentation or a blog post or shorter form stuff. Um, I'm really surprised that, you know, if you're an experienced Go developer, that probably means that you're already specializing. You have the T-shape, right? So you know all the keywords, you know all the design patterns, you know all the structures. But there's one thing that you went deep into. Where it could be for for most Go developers, I assume it's, uh, you know, microservices, backend, uh, web uh, applications. Uh, perhaps some of them is data engin- engineering, right? A small, a very small subset is uh, embedded uh, Go development, right? Uh, and for each of these segments, I would recommend a different book. But yeah. right now, I'm reading uh, designing, and you can do a screenshot the other way around. I'm reading uh, designing data intensive applications, uh, which is great. I'm about one third of the way through and i'm really sad that i didn't read it uh, in the past nice. uh, this clapman person is really really smart uh, and i think a lot of the problems even if you're not a data engineer discussing the problems of i don't know leaderless replication and the algorithms and the problems behind it is thinking patterns that you can apply to whatever you're developing right mm-hmm. so i don't know i think it's interesting but i haven't read anything go specific at least not yet until you recommend one well, I think it depends on what you're looking for. So the, the person who asked says that they have four years of experience in Go. He says, I don't feel like I have a structural knowledge to feel more confident and just want to be sure that I can answer common basic Go questions properly. Which book should I read? So it, it sounds like, although they're viewed as the resident Go expert, I guess, in a uh, team of Java developers, they don't feel like the expert. So they're wanting to get a more in-depth knowledge of Go. I think of, of the books that I read recently from my review series, the one I would recommend to a person like this is probably Go Fundamentals by Mark Bates and Corey Lanou. Uh, it's a fairly big book, 500 plus pages if I recall, but it goes into a lot of detail. Uh, so it, it's a, if you're looking for that sort of stuff, you know, to sort of s- fill in your missing gaps of knowledge about Go, that would be a great book for that topic. I think that one other thing that's worth mentioning is reading, uh, reading is passive. Like I would recommend mm-hmm. books if you're the Go expert for your team, you can grab a book that you know, I don't know, 80% of already, but if you do it as a workshop for your team or a journal club or a book club, that would be a lot more engaging. One of my previous jobs was training. I was in charge of uh, training a, an army course. And what they taught us there was that there's like, I don't know, whatever, seven layers of, of understanding a topic, right? So the first one is you, you memorize it. You don't understand anything, but you can say the words, right? Mm-hmm. And then you go up and up and up and up. And the top level is uh, teaching. If you can teach a subject to someone else, you understand it better. So I think this user is called Acrobatic Poetry. So Acrobatic Poetry, if you're listening, uh, or any other experienced developers in a team, the best way for you to learn is to teach your team. Set up a book club, read a chapter a week, and discuss it. Honestly, you know, a bit of a behind the scenes here. That's sort of why Jonathan and I are doing this podcast, right? Yeah. We wanted to stay. We know Go. We're not the best Go experts. I'm personally not a Go contributor. Jonathan, on the <laughs> other hand, has coding. So maybe I'm 
I'm, I'm misrepresenting when I said I'm not a Go expert. Jonathan is definitely is. I, 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 I'm the expert in wrapping simple uh, stringer functions. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you know that and you know if error changes, it's like eighty percent of the code, right? Right. <laughs> Anyways, the the best way to uh, learn and deepen your knowledge in something that you already uh, can be considered a senior or expert on is teaching. Uh, discussing and engaging yeah. about it can grant you a deeper understanding because you have to understand other people's uh, point of view, other people's difficulties in understanding the subject, and the, these discussions enrich your own understanding of the subject. So my recommendation is teach your team uh, and find a book that's easy for you to at least get started with. And that's also a, a great approach to reading these books. One last community post for today. We saw published yesterday, Dan the Good Man published a really, really interesting blog post uh, about Fire Scroll, which is a highly available multi-region key value database with massive read scal scalability. Sounds great. There are two ways to approach this very interesting topic. We're not going to dive deep into it at all. Uh, if you care about trying to use it, uh, then we'll put a link to the GitHub repository for Fire Scroll. Uh, there are very easy installation instructions and what's the API. The API is also very, very simple. Um, and it's written in Go, obviously. Obviously. Uh, and there's the blog post about it, which is really, really well written uh, and just goes through a process of, you know, what's the requirements? Why do they have their own DB? What's the architecture? What's the performance? What's the downsides of these specific, you know, this specific setup? I think it's really clever. The main thing that's interesting to see is that this is not a whole new DB from scratch. Uh, it's gluing existing tools like uh, Kafka or whatever, but it using existing infrastructure, uh, which is very interesting to see. And I highly recommend you check out both. Uh, if you do anything in data engineering or if, or if the specific use cases for uh, Fire Scroll are relevant to you. Uh, but it's just a really good read, regardless. It really reads like a, uh, someone who's working. Feels like sitting in an office next to this person while they solve this problem, uh, which is the, exactly the kind of blog posts I like. So I highly recommend it. And one of the tools it uses in the background we talked before, and that's BadgerDB. So it all, it's all coming together. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Nice. Uh, and we have a ton more to talk about, but this wraps up our time yes. for this week. All right. Well, that was an interesting week. I guess I will see you here same time next week. Shai. Yeah. We'll see you also after the ad break where we discuss some stuff, uh, other things we saw around our small community, not the entire Go community. <laughs> Have you had enough coffee yet, Shai, or do you need some more, Listen, some more I've been, caffeine? Okay, welcome to our ad break. Um, <laughs> we're going to do the things, but I'm looking for a job right now. And one of the side effects is that I'm traveling around Tel Aviv, you know, jumping into this office, that office, this office, that office. Everybody's offering me coffee because mm. they want to show off their fancy coffee machines and, their, and try to convince me to join. And, and they drinking. know you're the host of a coffee-themed podcast, so they're, they're trying to play. Some of them know. Uh, okay. Some of them are surprised. But I've been drinking so much coffee. It's been messing with my sleep. I've <laughs> oh, been, no. my pulse is, I need to scale it down a bit. So let's, let's relax. Let's relax the energy of this ad break as well. Let's take a breather. Deep breath. All right. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so um, we're looking for sponsors. We're actually actively considering one who reached out. But if you also want to reach out and uh, sponsor this show, grab this uh, segment of attention in our listeners' ears. Uh, you can reach us at kapago.dev. We're available on Slack. We also have a channel uh, in the Gopher Slack called hashtag cup hyphen o hyphen go. That's a kebab case with hyphens. Cup we should have spelled that out. Wouldn't that have been great? Cup, <laughs> cup H hyphen, -E -E <laughs> hyphen, and then H Y. That, that could have been nice. Uh, so, but we didn't. It's just cup of go. It's simple. Uh, and you can email us at news at cup of go dot dev. That is news at cup of go dot dev. If you like the show, please leave a review on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, share it. Share it with your mom. Send your mom an episode of Cup of Go. Well, yeah. That could be a nice conversation starter. 
Remember to talk to your, uh, your, your parents today. They, they probably bought you these headphones in a in, in di- direct or indirect way, right? Right. But you can also share it with coworkers uh, or your co-students that actually use Go. I think that would be more relevant. <laughs> um, now, Shai, the reason we're looking for a sponsor, of course, is we're trying to get rich, right? Uh, so, yeah, the, my goal with the show is just to get rich. Um, and I don't, this is the, the whole point. That, uh, that was our whole brainstorm. It's like, Shy Jonathan, how can we get rich as quickly as possible? <laughs> Let's make a podcast about Go News. <laughs> yeah. So the reason we're looking for sponsors is to make, keep the show running, uh, and, you know, keep the, the community alive. Uh, we have to do some stuff to make this happen, right? We have to record it. We have to edit it. Um, I don't want to say we have to look for news because that's the whole point of looking yeah. for the show. But it is a time sink. It costs us time. It's not just uh, getting up to the meeting and recording it, right? Right. Uh, we have to edit a lot of uh, cuss words out, like and we're looking for sponsors who you know care about Go and want to give us some money to keep the show running and perhaps get some attention as well. Yeah, that, that's the arrangement. Uh, definitely. Uh, Jonathan, when, with his uh, multiple engagement with uh, various clients, especially now that he's a Go contributor, mm-hmm. um, on the same stage as uh, uh, Russ and Rob. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's um, paying me to speak at their Go conference yet. <laughs> yet. Um, but, um, you know, we have, we have like our own uh, things going that actually make us money. We just want to cover the costs yeah. of the show and keep the community running and alive. Exactly. And one other way we want to do that is to give you cups. Uh, Yay. We're setting up a merch line. Like we discussed in a previous episode, we asked you if you want it. You said yes. Um, so we're going to do Capo Go cups. We'll also put out some stickers. We're getting the shop set up, and uh, we'll put the link in the show notes and also send it in our Slack group. Definitely. I'm right? looking forward to that. My wife is looking forward to that. She loves those stickers. I, I am half of mind. Of, like, um, I do have some stickers on my laptop, but not everything that people send me. I don't put any stickers on my laptop, but I give them to my wife, and her, her laptop is covered in stickers that she doesn't understand. Things about <laughs> Kubernetes and... and go and, and who knows what uh, well, but they're cute so she likes them the go for a thing is really it's a such a smart move for a, <laughs> uh, you know for language it's a really good uh, logo anyway that wraps it up for this ad break stick around for a discussion about something that came up in our slack group so Shai, you were telling me that you've been drinking a lot of coffee lately do you want to tell us about that I, mean, I know that you love coffee that's why you're on the show yeah, but, uh, but too there's much more of to a it. good thing. Uh, actually, it's not all good. A lot of the coffee I've been drinking is uh, very, very shitty. Uh, but oh, no. uh, I've been drinking a lot of coffee because I'm looking for a job. Uh, if you've listened to the previous episodes, you might know I've even sponsored one of our episodes yes. <laughs> uh, with my job search. And I have a few leads, uh, promising ones, that I, I went to their offices and I met them. and It, it was very interesting. So that that's a good segue into a topic I think we're going to talk about here. Um, I'm curious, have you had any of those famous cultural fit interviews yet? I've definitely had my share of questions I'm uncomfortable answering that try to sort of stereotype me. Um, okay. I'm also very outspoken, so it's very easy to see what my quote-unquote culture is. Uh, it's also very easy to see my age because uh, people yeah. know when I enlisted to the army. Uh, it's very easy to know where I live. Uh, it's very easy to, from the way I speak in Hebrew at least, it's very easy to categorize me into you know these specific stereotypes. Is that because of dialect differences, or I mean, I don't speak Hebrew. So, so I... in Israel, you have, t- at least in the secular Jewish community, you have two sort of people. You have really, really white people, and you have off uh, white people, like Sephardic Jews. So it's easy to see that I'm. Uh, somewhat of a Sephardic Jew, but on the other hand, you know, people hear my accent, which is compared to Israeli accents, not very, it doesn't sound very Israeli. Uh, it, mm-hmm. It's not, a, a you know, directly NPR voice uh, American like yours, uh, but uh, okay. it's a lot better than the average. Um, so people stereotype me, they stereotype me into, uh, 
you're uh, from the army, which in uh, in Israel means a lot. Um, you're from the center of Israel. Um, you're kind of rich. You're kind of uh, sophisticated. You're you know English very well. Uh, you're kind of uh, I don't know. I think people might see me as uh, I don't know. Very there there are a lot of characteristics that people think about me. Without mm-hmm. without me telling them or without them asking anything concrete uh, about okay. this specific thing, and is that good for you? Um, These are all positive things they think about you, or are there some negative ones? I think that it's for for me it's easier. Uh, mm-hmm. Most of the things that I self select into the groups uh, that already are pre- doing pretty well in the Israeli high tech scene. Um, mm-hmm. X uh, Army, for example, is a good uh, group to self-select into because mm-hmm. most of the people who interview you are similar, which is sort of, it's not a culture fit, right? It's just like, I want to hire people that look like me, sound like me, have the same background, uh, mm-hmm. speak the same language, uh, have the same set of uh, values. Um, and, you know, let's open it up. The same sort of similar age range, same gender, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So that that that's really interesting to hear. I mean, I've had some experiences similar, I suppose, when I was interviewing in the past too. But it, it brings us to this comment that uh, I want to shout out to. I hope I say your name right, Laura Vron- Vronea, maybe. Um, she hopped on our Slack channel. Uh, thanks, Laura, and she had this insightful comment. I'll, I'll just read it here for the for the listeners. Thanks for the great show and latest episode. Oh, you're welcome, Laura. You're welcome. Uh, When listening (laughs) to the recruitment interview, which happened on last week's show, one thing came out to my mind was the misuse of, quote, cultural fit, end quote, in the recruitment process. I have seen companies turning the culture fit as a reason not to hire people from different, uh, people different from them. That leads to homogeneous teams that have only people with the same age, gender, sexual orientation, language, and so on. Uh, It is... Uh, it, it is always easy to turn down a candidate by stating the person is not a cultural fit, even though unconsciously the reason would be the person being somewhat different from the hiring team. Recruiters should pay active attention to this and clearly define what qualities in a person make this cultural fit. Um, what do you think about that in given your current uh, experience? So th- there are two sides to this. I was a hiring manager uh, in my previous role. I hired people to my R&D team. Mm -hmm. And people walked into the office. They interviewed. Technically, they were, they passed. If they, even if they were the best, uh, you know, in their cohort in that week, uh, technically. But they didn't fit uh, our company's culture. Um, and sometimes I could really point out, I could say this specific thing is not okay with our culture. I like talk to the person and it seems that they're very, uh, I don't know. Our culture is very open. Uh, and, uh, it, my previous company was very open and very respectful. And I could uh, see that the person was passive aggressive and, and very like argumentative and, and it's just going to cause a lot of uh, bad vibes in the employment history. I could see similar things in, uh, you know, references people said similar things i could point out a specific thing and say this person is not going to be respectful it's not going to be inclusive it's not going to be i don't know whatever um Mm -hmm. and and i could point out a specific thing that doesn't fit the culture but many times uh someone from the hiring team had a gut feeling they couldn't point out a specific thing but they said it's not going to be a culture fit and i'm wondering how much of that was uh biases towards uh, age gender um i don't know we didn't really have a problem with sexual orientation at least my last company um mm-hmm. language and i also think by the way something to point out is uh I, i'm not exactly sure what's the politically correct terms here so excuse me but neurodivergent people people who might mm-hmm. uh, have adhd or might uh just not be the happiest person on the planet um and it, it it gets painted as culture fit and you basically don't hire them because they're depressed or you don't hire yeah. them because they're ADHD, even if they do have the tools to be super productive while dealing with their issues. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so from a hiring manager perspective, I've definitely sometimes felt very comfortable pointing out, this is the company's culture. Uh, we learn, for example, and someone has been in the same job for 12 years, didn't read any book. So I'm like, oh, you, you're not a culture fit. We learn every day. You didn't learn anything for the last 12 years. You're not a culture fit. Uh, mm-hmm. But sometimes I felt really uncomfortable with pointing that out. Um, now, as, a, as I'm interviewing in places, it feels really bad that, you know, you're, you're, the moment you step in the, in the door, they already have an idea of whether you're going to fit or not, just based on how you look, uh, mm-hmm. how you talk, um, without any regards to what value you're going to bring. Uh, some companies I've interviewed uh, at were very upfront about this is the company's culture. This is what we think about you. And now let us know if we're right or wrong. That has mm-hmm. been great. Uh, I think mm-hmm. it's very good to be upfront about those stuff. Some companies, and you know, I'll freely admit here, one of the, the leads that I'm still working um, in the final stages, I have just a bad vibe because they, they tell that their vibe is fun, but the office was super not fun. They say that mm. I'll have a lot of place to influence, but to me, it seems like it's super top-down management. And, and it seems like it, it really is not a culture fit for me, but they're not really upfront about this. You know, the, the interview was, I, I asked, what do you want to know about me? And the, what they said was, how about you tell us what you want to ask us, and then we'll figure out more about you. And it feels, <laughs> it, it, it's, un, I don't know, I want to say imbalanced because it is imbalanced i'm looking for a job Mm -hmm. and they're offering me a job Uh, there's definitely a a stronger party here Uh, but sometimes a a lot of places and many of my leads are are not are not handling this well Uh, many are but many are not i think it's a great point by laura Um, people are not aware of these biases or even worse they're aware and they're like that's how business is done yeah so I think it's a complicated issue, and my comment in response to Laura was that I think it's a, a dangerous criteria, and not because it's inherently bad, but because it's so easy to do it wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think there's many things that fall under the umbrella of cultural fit. Um, I, I think when I first started hearing that term, the things that came to my mind were things like, are you insatiably curious? Are you, do you have a sort of... Uh, attitude of I'm going to get this done. Are you, are you, or as Joel Spolsky's book says, uh, I think it's, um, I have to look it up now. Joel Spolsky from, uh, Stack Overflow. Yeah. Smart and gets things done. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a book called smart and gets things done. Uh, you know, so are you that kind of person? Um, so that was sort of my first thought about what cultural fit me. Not I mean in this conversation, I mean in the last few years as this sort of concept has become more popular. But now that I think about it, I think those are more like aptitude than culture. Because uh, you know, I think anybody from any culture can be smart and get things done. It's not really, you know, are you, are you uh, white and Christian or, or are you from a Muslim background or from a Jewish background? You know, th- th- those are cultural things. And people in all of those areas can be smart and get things done. And they can be curious and they can be team players and all that sort of stuff. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, let's just stop calling it cultural fit and call it something else. Um, on the other hand, there are times when I think cultural fit, you know, in the purest sense, is appropriate. You know, if you're a wellness company selling uh, yoga courses or something, you probably want to hire people who believe in doing yoga and that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you're not going to hire somebody who wants to just sit around and watch TV and eat potato chips all day. You know, that's not a cultural fit in that sense. A good, a good example of that is me. But, you know, I'm looking for a job right now. Mm-hmm. And gaming companies. Gaming, not in the... the you know, Unity or, or pure gaming. So it's like gaming g- mm-hmm. gambling-ish companies. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, or just pure gambling companies. Uh, offensive cyber companies. Uh, Web3 and crypto companies. Uh, binary options companies. Like all these sort of organizations reach out to me and I, I don't want to work with them because it's not a culture fit. I don't believe in the... I think what they're doing is not great. I don't want to be part of this industry. And obviously yeah. this is a different... Uh, cultural difference right they think that right. the, the business is fine or even good or even positive and i believe this is a cultural thing that it's not a, a good thing and what is good what is bad these are cultural philosophical things um, right but i know it will impact my 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 i don't know job performance my job satisfaction but i don't want to work there so it's it, it's a good idea to lay it out up front like you said yoga is a very innocuous example I think Web3 yeah. is a very divisive example where many of mm-hmm. our listeners 
probably are total total crypto bros and you know have uh f uh dot f in their twitter handle and have nfts <laughs> and maybe perhaps work for a company to do uh, web3 it, it makes sense yeah. if uh, you know since there's a lot of go in that space right um and some of our listeners are probably more like me and they don't like that industry that much and they think it's a grift and a scam and whatever these are mm-hmm. cultural things uh, right. that would make people not enjoy working together in a team exactly uh one of the things we discussed in this thread by the way is the fa- if you listened to the interview last week the interview was with a recruitment agency right um so what would be their take on the words culture fit let's say a company is using misusing culture fit right you're just a recruitment agency what can you do um mm. i mean but, but what i asked you was what would you say as the agency if you're working with a client and they give you the culture fit line for the fourth or fifth woman programmer in a row mm-hmm. uh, in your lineup that doesn't feel great it sucks but you're an agency uh how can you change you know the company's mind here but we figure out some interesting points yeah. on you know yeah. how you can impact from the outside as well and not just if you're a hiring manager i think uh, as a hiring manager this isn't answering your question because i don't have an answer to that question i don't know what agency should do i think my view is most of the time the cultural fit decision should be on the shoulders of the candidate not the company and the company has the onus to let the candidate know what their culture is like and let the candidate self-select whether or not they're going to be comfortable there uh, so in other words if i'm a yoga company using an innocuous example again if i'm a yoga whatever company i'm not going to be interviewing you so what do you think about yoga how does yoga feel to you you know are you really a good fit i'm going to be saying look we're all about yoga here we all do yoga for an hour every morning uh we all drink uh organic tea at lunchtime you know whatever the sort of stuff we do we do all that you decide if you're comfortable with that as a candidate And then I could ask how far this goes, you know, like I'm thinking about this company sounds great, but then I'm like, okay, maybe it's too far into, you know, alternative medicine. And like, mm-hmm. uh, do, is it okay if I work here, you know, if I'm vaccinated, uh, these right. are like, <laughs> no, I'm like, okay, good. Thanks for letting me know. This is the culture here. I, I can, yeah. I can back out, uh, early and it's better right. for both parties. I, I have a close friend who worked uh, for a while at a vet, veterinarian company. It was a company that sold software to veterinarians. And they had an open policy that you bring your pets to work anytime you want to. And I think that's great, but that's a very cultural aspect. I would hate that as a, uh, on my, personally. I wouldn't want to work at an office that had dogs and cats running around. Uh, not because I, per se, hate dogs and cats, but more does it be a distraction, and I just don't want to mess with that. Uh, but other people absolutely love that. And so I think that's a great sort of cultural fil- filter, but it shouldn't be the company deciding, oh, we don't want you to work here because you don't like cats. It should be, we have cats, and if you don't like that, you decide whether you're comfortable or not. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's very easy to reach compromises uh internally as well it doesn't have to be a blanket policy in my previous right. company you had the blanket policy you can you can bring your doc to work uh but then someone didn't like it so we limited it to one floor so people who don't like dogs and cats can go on the first floor and people who do can go on the second floor and it's fine yeah uh, people can work out these cultural differences uh sure. pretty often uh, i think so again we really want to say uh thanks a lot to laura um for bringing up this topic it's super interesting issue uh and two people who talked with us about it uh andre zarpi john mcguire uh, and obviously uh callum and fraser williams from uh go tech which we reviewed uh interviewed last week yeah if you have thoughts come share uh, come join us on slack and we can continue the discussion there yeah we're in the go for slack at couple go kebab case with hyphens not spelled out <laughs> um and uh, Yeah, and it's just sort of a meta thing. Super, I was super just jazzed to see us talking about a super interesting topic, you know, hiring, recruiting with the people who do it, with the recruiting agency. And then, you know, Go developers and, and people who are passionate about Go coming to Slack and talking about it. Uh, I'll send a Callum and Fraser an email to drop their thoughts as well. So uh, you can probably see them respond pretty soon, hopefully. Uh, so come check out the discussion and other discussions that are happening here. Suggest topics, uh, give us feedback, hate mail. Come talk to us. Definitely.